Hey, it's so good to come to you this morning from First Assembly. We're glad that you could join with us. You know, it's a blessing and an honor to, to have the opportunity to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, and that's exactly what we intend to do today. You know, we can't view this as, as an opportunity where we can't meet, but we could come together in one mind, in one accord, in our own homes. So would you join with us in worship? I want you to just take this opportunity to stand, actually, and to engage in worship with us today. You know, don't just sit there on your phone and, and watch the service. I mean, if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. But, you know, what better way to honor God and to worship Him by standing and engaging with us? I just want to take an opportunity to read a, 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 one of my favorite psalms. Of course, I, I think all, my, all the psalms are pretty much my favorite. But Psalm 95 specifically. It says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth, and the heights of the hills are His also. The sea is His, and He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. So would you worship with us right now? Can we go to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your grace and Your mercy. Lord, we thank You that, that You are our Creator. Lord, that You hold this world, this seemingly broken world even, in your hands. Lord, that none of this takes you by surprise. In fact, we have the freedom to come to you in peace and safety. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, amen. Come on, can we worship the Lord this morning?
take their place with selfless faith, selfless faith. I see a new revival. Yes, it's stirring as we pray. Yes, we're all. salvation the gift of God the 
Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that it is finished. Lord, on the cross of Calvary, through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, you finished your work there. Lord, it is that blood that we celebrate today. Lord, it is that blood that we declare. It is finished. Lord, we plead the blood over every human being on the face of the planet today. Lord, over every business, over every believer, it says, if we would cry out to you, Lord, that you would answer us. Lord, it says if we humble ourselves, if we pray, Lord, if we, if we seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, Lord, that you would hear from heaven. Lord, today we ask that you hear from heaven. Lord, we have lifted up our praise to you from on high. Lord, we thank you for everything that you have done, everything that you are doing on this earth. And Lord, we ask you today, heal our land. Heal our land, Jesus. Heal our land, Lord. Lord, we look to you, Father, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, you have finished your work on Calvary. Come on, right now, right there in your living rooms, right there where you are today. You, you may be dealing with anxiety. You may be dealing with stress. You may be dealing with depression. You may be dealing with sickness in your body. I want you to know that the work of Calvary, the work of Jesus Christ is a finished work that we can call upon him in this moment. You know, when the centurion came to Jesus and he had a, a sick servant in his home, he told Jesus, he said, just send the word and my servant will be healed. This is what Jesus said. He said, no greater faith is there in all of Israel. Come on, right now, we're just going to declare and decree a word today in your life. If you need healing right there, would you come into agreement with us? If you need hope in your life, if you need comfort in your life, would you come into agreement with us in this moment? Come on, just as a sign of surrender, if you could, just lift your hands in the air. Say, Lord, I receive my healing. Lord, I receive you to come into my life and bring comfort and peace, Lord. Lord, I surrender my life to you in this moment, Lord. Bring healing. Lord, I just look to you for my strength. I look to you for my hope. I look to you for everything that's within me. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I receive your forgiveness in my life. Lord, we thank you for it. Lord, we give you all the praise. Lord, we give you all the honor. Lord, we give you all the glory. Lord, even in these moments, Lord, it says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. Lord God, that we will begin to declare the miraculous work of God throughout all the land. Lord, just send your word and we'll be healed. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. Lord, we pray these things. Lord, we plead your blood because it is finished. So, Lord, we ask that you come into this service, that you join with us even in the more real way than you ever have before. Lord, send your presence, your Holy Spirit. Friends at home, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit right there where you are today? The Holy Spirit is present with you. It don't have to have a gathering. It says simply where two or three gather together, there I am. Come on, would you believe that with me this morning? We thank you for it. We give you all the honor and the praise and all the glory. Come on, right there where you are. Can you just say amen with me? Amen, amen, amen. It is done. It is done. It is finished. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you so much. Hey, right there where you are, typically, I'm pretty sure you know everybody that's around you, so don't. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time introducing ourselves to one another. But just have a seat, and if you would, we'll be right back with you in just a few moments. We have some announcements and, and some other things we want to share with you before we get into the message this morning. Hey, church. We have a few upcoming announcements for you. First, we want to stay connected with you. 
be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and our website. Here, we will be constantly uploading new content as well as any news we may have for you. Visit our website, firstassembly.place, for our weekly online schedule. Parents, we have tons of resources and activities for you and your kids to do together. Visit our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel for JBQ devotions, weekly scripture memory verses, and much more. If you are in need of food, contact our food pantry at 337-277-5172 as the church wants to be a blessing to you during this time. Turn into our Resurrection Sunday service on April 12th at 10 a.m. Join us as we celebrate Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, risen and alive. Last but not least, join us every day at 7.14 a.m. and 7.14 p.m. on Facebook for a time of live prayer and encouragement with our pastors and team. Visit our website for our weekly prayer guides. Hey, good morning. pastor asked me to take a few minutes and just talk about receiving an offering today, and certainly I, I would love the opportunity to do so, but I'd like to start off by telling you a little story that I think might help. Um, many years ago, I was praying, and I was asking the Lord just to kind of help me surrender more of my life to Him, and, and Lord, train me and, 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 and help me to become more disciplined to you, whether that was reading the scriptures or prayer, whatever it may have been. But nonetheless, I really felt the Lord speak to me afterwards. And the word that came to me was, stop at stop signs. Now, I know you're thinking, what does this have to do with tithing? And I'm going to tell you in a moment. Hopefully, it'll fit all together. But at that time, I would maybe come to a stop sign, kind of check out the area. Hey, if it wasn't you know, congested, didn't see any cars, you know, I'd slow it down, kind of move on a little bit, or maybe do a rolling stop, things like that. But when the Lord challenged me at that time to stop at a stop sign, I think what he was really saying to me is, are you willing to surrender yourself to be obedient to the things I'm asking you to do? And at times, it doesn't make sense, but are you willing to be obedient to do the things that I've called you to do? And if you do so, there'll be a blessing as a result of that. Well, needless to say, for those that have been driving for any period of time, you can only imagine that as a result of allowing myself to yield, to train myself, muscle memory, all those different things, right? But there have been times in my life when I've come to a stop, and because of that training, I've looked, and as a result of that, I saw an unexpected vehicle that I would have never seen otherwise closing in on me. Had I not stopped and kept going across that line, who's to say what would have happened? Certainly an accident of sorts, perhaps a very serious accident for myself and perhaps for another driver. So moving into tithing right now, I think it's the same thing. I think that oftentimes we look at tithing and we sometimes get to a place of trying to decide, well, do I give today? Do I not give today? You know, the government's going to come in, step in with the stimulus. They're going to be giving some money and stuff. So is it really important that I give? I mean, I'm just one person. What can I do? But it's not about that. What it's about is am I willing to be obedient, surrender to the Lord, and trust Him and take the steps necessary for allow the Lord to bless me. And, you know, the Scripture says that we start off by give and it shall be given unto you. So we initiate the process. We initiate the promise. If we're faithful to give, the Lord goes on to say, it will be given to us. Good measure, shaken together, and running over will man give unto you bosom. So as we train ourselves to give to the Lord, we also do so in times when there's abundance, but also maybe when there's not so an abundance. But let's think about that. Is God ever limited by his ability to bless us? No, not at all. So today I'd like to just share with you so let's be faithful. Let's, let's trust the Lord. We don't have to go past the stop sign and get an accident to realize he was right and we were wrong. Let's trust him today that he is right, that we do want the blessings of the Lord for ourselves and our family and to be a blessing to others. And today we're going to have four ways of being able to do that. One is you can give online. You can go to www.firstassembly.place. You can give. You can go and text to Youngsville First to 77977. If you prefer to just put it in the mail, that's, that's fine too. So 3555, 3555, Verat School Road, Youngsville, Louisiana, 70592. Or you can come to the church physically and drop it off in the drop box, which is underneath the breezeway. 
Now, I'm going to tell you this. We have another way, too. So if you want to go by Pastor Joe's house around 2 in the morning and blow your horn, Pastor Joe, Shannon, or the kids are going to come out there and pick up the check. Huh? Yeah. If you do that, rest assured, you probably won't be seeing Brian for a long, long time. But the other ones do work. So again, I thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord. I thank you even now for the blessing that you're going to receive, for, the, for, for being obedient to the Lord. And I just pray that all is well for you and your family uh, at this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. Praise God. It's so good to come to you today right here from our, our living room studio. You know, isn't it just amazing that, that here we are on Palm Sunday and, and not able to gather together at church, but I believe that God is doing something on this earth. I believe that God is using this opportunity to strengthen families. I believe that God is using this opportunity to do something unique and new and powerful on the earth. And uh, I just pray that you can begin to just, just come into agreement with us, with us in this season and uh, just share in that excitement to embrace this, uh, this, this season of change. You know, uh, the longer we fight against it, I feel the longer we're going to be drawn into a place we don't want to go. So, so I'm just asking you to just go with us uh, on this journey in your own homes. And in fact, uh, today we're just going to have a, uh, just a message called Hosanna. And, uh, you know, it is Palm Sunday, and I believe that that is, is such a powerful message for the day. Can you just say that with me, Hosanna? Come on, just, can you just lift up your hands in the air right there and say, Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Man, what a powerful, powerful word from the Lord. You know, today as we celebrate Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday really begins what most people consider the beginning of Holy Week. And in fact, I would say that Palm Sunday kind of represents this one week that changed the world. And if, if you don't think that you can change the world in a week, just look what's happened over the past couple of weeks. I mean, just in three short weeks, the entire world has changed. The entire world is different. And uh, we just could come together and celebrate that today, and just celebrate what Jesus Christ has done on the earth, what he's done for me, what he's done for you. You know, in this desperate hour, many of us are looking for a Savior. Many of us are looking for answers. Many of us are looking for hope. I, I mean, I know I am. This is a difficult time. I mean, I thought I can just be maybe a little transparent with you. You know, a, a lot of times when I'm talking, you don't have to kind of wear the smile, but... You know, on the inside, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's, you know, my love language is, is hugs. My love language is, is closeness and touch. And in this season, it's really, it's really a challenge. But, you know, it's a desperate hour, and many people are looking for a Savior. I, in fact, I would even say this, that even atheists right now are believing, and they're hoping beyond hope that, that God answers the church's prayer. <laughs> I mean, isn't that a unique season? Many of us are looking for comfort and security and hope and certainty. And, you know, it's kind of hard to find those things today. They, they look towards government. They look towards the medical community. You know, they look into the church, but I believe that the only place we can truly find comfort is in Jesus Christ. We can only find comfort in the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. So today, as we just uh, dive into the Word of God, I want to ask you, if you will, turn with me in your Bible, if you have a... If you have a Bible or if you may have, a, you may have an app or something on your phone, that's fine. And uh, we're just going to dig into the Word of God today and, uh, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. And I want to talk a little bit today about the triumphal entry. This is what many people would call this passage of Scripture. And this is totally surrounded around, around Palm Sunday. I'll give you just a moment to, uh, to get there with me. Uh, if not, we'll have some scripture verses, I'm sure, on the screen. We have a wonderful media team. I want to encourage you, if you, have a, if you have a chance over these next weeks, just look, you can just go on Facebook and let our media team know how much you appreciate them for being able to bring this type of, uh, this type of interface. I was, I was reading an article just, uh, just today, in fact, just talking about the Spanish flu in, in 1918. And uh, it, what's interesting about that is churches had to shut down then, too to stop the spread of the pandemic. And this is right on the heels of the Azusa Street Revival. Don't you know that, that the Spanish flu didn't slow down revival? Don't you know that the coronavirus isn't going to slow down the move of God 
it, it, it's not going to slow it down at all. So, so don't think that this is some the end of the world thing. This is just God doing something new on the earth. Come on, man. Somebody shout hallelujah. Anyway, so triumphal entry. Matthew 21. I want to look in verse 10, and I kind of want to start there. Matthew 21, 10 says this. And when he, when he Jesus, had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Who is this, the son of David? And many of you know that, that Jesus, he is the, considered the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the one who has the lineage of David. Jesus is the one who, who carries that birthright. Who is this blessed one? Who is this one that brings blessing and healing and brings hope and salvation into the world? Who is this one who comes in the name of the Lord? You know, today people are moved, as it says here in Matthew 21, 10, it says that the city was moved. Today I believe that people are moved, people are wondering, people everywhere are watching. They want to see what's going to happen. If you look in, in, in the, the translation of that, that word moved is more than just they were moved. I mean, it says literally they were shaken, they were agitated, they were unnerved. I mean, today that is what's happening. I mean, people everywhere are on edge. I, I, I've seen people in, in grocery stores act totally unnatural. I've seen people in, in business places acting unnatural. Even going through the drive through all of our customer service skills have gone out the window because people are unnerved, they're moved, they're agitated, they're wondering, they're looking in this season. You know, I believe that, that the threat of a virus has driven our nation to respond in desperation. I, I would ask you this today. Will, will the, if the threat of a virus can drive a nation to, to respond in desperation, can the promise of a Savior drive a nation to its knees in repentance? You see, if, if, if we can allow a worldwide pandemic to come forth because of a virus, why can't we allow a worldwide celebration because of the coming of the Savior King, Jesus Christ? Just on that day, of Palm Sunday, they knew something was unique about Jesus. Man, I, I, I am so excited about this, this season, this week. I believe that even God will begin to move this week supernaturally in ways we couldn't even wonder or, or, or even imagine. Man, I just want to kind of got, get into the Word a little bit and just read through the rest of, of Matthew 21. We're going to read through Matthew 21, 1 through 12. I believe that that as many of you understand who our church is, and man, if this is your first time watching online, you've never been to one of our services, I want to encourage you, would we have the opportunity to meet again, would you come? Because we're a body ministry. We, we believe in body ministry. We believe in the move of the Spirit and the functionality and the gifts of the Holy Spirit at work in our services. We are a Bible-believing church. We're a Christ-centered church. We are a place to meet with God. So I want to encourage you, if, if you've never came to our services, to come when you have an opportunity. But uh, it, Matthew 21, 1 through 11 says this. It says, And now when they drew near to, to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me, and if, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. I want you just to get, just kind of just, you know, I, well, sometimes we read these words on, on a page. I want you to just begin to get an understanding of what's happening here. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. They're getting close to, and they're preparing for the Passover. It's a Jewish celebration that, that we kind of have wrapped around uh, Easter or Resurrection Sunday. And in this season, Jesus is, they're traveling down. They're coming from the Mount of Olives. It's this steep hill, this steep precipice. And as they're coming in, Jesus sends two disciples ahead of him, and he gives them these instructions. Verse 4. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. And this is actually um, the prophet Zechariah saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They bought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them 
and set him on them. Set him being Jesus. Verse 8, And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. This is where we get the idea of Palm Sunday. And then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the Son of God. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Would you go with me to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word brings life. Lord, it breathes life into us. Lord, I pray that you allow my words to be anointed this day. Lord, that you anoint our ears to hear and our our, our eyes to see the truth of who you are. We thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You know, in this story, it's it's an incredible story. I mean, you have Jesus. He's coming into Jerusalem, and there's things that begin to happen that are totally unexpected. In fact, Jesus comes in. He's riding in on a on a, on a colt of a donkey, a little small colt. And, and pe- I mean, just think about, get the image. It's this parade. They're parading Jesus into town. There's people going before. There's people going after. And they're beginning to say, Hosanna, and Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I believe that this is a picture for us. It's an example of our role, firstly, in the kingdom of God. Secondly, this is an example of Christ's return to claim his bride. And third, that this is an example of what the world's response is to Jesus. You see, I believe that in that season, you see, it was prophesied by the prophet Daniel that they believed that, that 483 years, I think it is, from the time that, the, that the, the, they began to build the temple, that the Messiah would return. You see, people had an expectation that the Messiah was coming. They were waiting on this Messiah. And they believed, even at that time, the multitudes believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the promised one, come to redeem the people of Israel. See, the world was waiting on Jesus. I believe that even in that same way today that the world is waiting in Jesus and God is priming us, the church began to, to parade Jesus into our culture, to parade Jesus into our reality. You see, the the church is looking for something to do in this season and how to respond. I believe that our response is found in this story. We can learn many things. Many of us are trapped at home. What are we going to do? How are we going to live our lives? How are we going to present Jesus? Man, I I believe that we see it right here. Many of us say, well, we can't meet in large gatherings. We can't go to coffee shops. We can't go to the homeless shelters or, or to the food pantries and the food banks. We can't do the things we normally do. Well, that's okay. Man, I think that that that's, could be even a good thing in this season. I want to just take a moment today, just kind of dissect, dissect these verses of Scripture a little bit. As we read in, in verse 1, it says this at the end of that. It says, it says that Jesus sent two disciples. You know, what's, what's, what's amazing about that story is that Jesus used his disciples to do simple tasks that led to profound results. I mean, think about that. He said to these two disciples, these unnamed disciples he said go and get me a donkey go and find a donkey that's tied up man I mean think about that they're like probably saying geez why why do I have to go why do I always have to go do the things no one else wants to do you see we don't always understand what or why God's calling us to do something but I want to assure you that even in the simplest things God can do the miraculous I remember a story me and Shannon uh, and she, I don't think she remembers this because I've asked her about it, but this was probably close to 15 years ago. And uh, we, were, we were at Christ for the Nations Institute at, in, in, in Dallas, Texas, and we had the opportunity to go sit with some up-and-coming youth pastors who were just getting out of school or finishing up their school term there at CFNI. And uh, I bought them to eat lunch, and we were sitting outside at a Sonic drive through You know, they have the benches outside. We are sitting there, and I, I remember this vividly. And I was in the workforce working at the time, and, and I mean, I, can even, I was eating one of those burritos, you know, those, uh, those, those supersonic burritos. Man, it was, I remember this so vividly, because, because it was one of those stories that kind of stuck in my mind. I'm having this conversation, 
and they're, these kids are just coming out of, of youth camp, right? And, and they were just kind of complaining to me. They were saying, man, we thought when we went to youth camp to volunteer that we'd get to preach and we'd get to do music and we'd get to do all these things, but all they ever use us to do is clean the toilets and sweep the floors and vacuum and, and do all the stuff that no one else wants to do. And, and I remember, I just looked at these guys, I'm like, man, don't you know how powerful that really is for you? I mean, you can have the, the best preaching on the planet. You can have the best music, but if the floors are dirty and the bathrooms are stink, then nobody's going to show up at your venue. You see, it, it doesn't matter that somebody has to do the small things, and I believe that God uses the most obedient of us to do those small things. So don't be upset when we get put on donkey duty. Don't be upset when God says, hey, I want you to do some simple things to open doors for greater things. You see, we may not have the opportunity to do ministry on the outside, but I want you to know today we have the opportunity to do the simplest things. This is just the opportunity God may be waiting on you for you to go and talk to your neighbor, to call that family member, to, to, to reach out to your children and to build relationship with them. Today may feel like donkey duty, but I want you to know that, that man, it can lead to such great things in our futures. I love this. If we skip ahead to, to verse 6, it says, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. I, I want to just read that again because it's powerful. The disciples, what did they do? They went and did as Jesus commanded them. You know, it, I mean, I know that seems so simple and profound. Yeah, they listened to Jesus. I mean, they listened to Jesus, and Jesus told them to do some pretty wild things. Hey, go to this random house, and there's going to be a man carrying a water pot, and go talk to him and, and tell them that you, need a, that, that, to, that you need a room to have Passover, and, and he's going to lead you there. Go find these donkeys, and if anybody needs them, tell them that the, the master has need of them, and he'll send them. Man, don't you know that when Jesus sends you to do something, it's best just to be obedient? Obedience is a powerful, powerful instrument of our faith. In fact, in 1 Samuel 15, 22, it, it says that to obey is better than sacrifice. In John 14, 15, it says this, that if you love me, keep my commands. It's just about obedience. You know, faith is just about obedience. I want you to just let that sink in for a moment. You know, faith isn't always about doing extraordinary. Faith isn't always about doing what no one else uh, seems to do. Faith is just about doing the simple things that God calls us to do each and every day. Obey His commands. You know, I, I love this story because in this, you see that none of the disciples are mentioned by name. Because, you see, they're not the focus. They're serving with humility. They're saying yes, even though they don't get any of the recognition. You see, they never even ask, hey, what's in it for me? What's in it for my ministry? What's in it for my family? What's in it for my pocketbook? What's in it for me, Jesus? You see, because it was all about the focus of this, the focus of Palm Sunday, the focus of all this is to put our focus on Jesus. You know, that's really what we're called to do. Put our focus on Him. Be obedient to Him. Follow His commandments. Man, think of a world that may, that may look like that today. Think if we just begin to minister like that today, selflessly, without having to have our names on the front page of a newspaper. In fact, Jesus says, when you pray, don't, don't go on to the street corner where you can have everybody be, see you pray and you can look holy and all that stuff. He said, don't make it a big deal. He said, because there's people that do that, they'll have their reward. He said, but when you pray, go into the secret place, and the things you do there that are done in private, God will, will, will reward you openly. When you give, don't, don't, don't call the herald and the trumpeter when you give. He said, just give privately. If you want to give, if God puts it on your heart, be obedient to do that. Don't make it such a big deal. And, and the God who, who sees you do in secret, He's going to reward you openly. We need to serve in humility, even in this season. You know, what's, what's interesting about all of this is that, that churches and ministries and people all around the world, you know, they don't have these big buildings to go to. They're having to just minister from who they are, and that's exactly what 
these disciples did. They simply did as Jesus commanded them to do. And I love this. This is, the, this is what I love. That Jesus says this, or, or, or the, the, the Bible says this. He says that they served and that they began to, to lay their clothes on the donkey for Jesus to sit. You see, it's not just about serving. Many times it's about serving with excellency. You know, not only did they go and, and get the donkey, but they came back and they began to prepare that donkey and that colt because they knew that, that the King of kings, the Lord of lords, was going to be sitting upon it. You know, many times we, we do things and we just do what's necessary to get by. Even in this season of solitude, this season of, of quarantine, you know, we, we need to operate with excellence as a church. We need to operate with excellence when God calls us to do something. Be thankful to the Lord. But what's interesting here is that they says that they laid, disciples laid their clothes on the donkey for, for Jesus to sit on. And, you know, in that season and even now, clothing, it was and is, is a precious commodity. You know, clothing really has a lot of value. It really has a lot of meaning. In fact, in that time, even more then than it does now, our clothing was our identity. You see, whenever they would wear clothes, like they had a beggar's cloak. So they would wear this cloak and they would beg. People just knew they can know by the clothes that you wear who you are. It really represents your identity. Even, even today, bankers or, 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 or preachers or celebrities or, or whoever that may be, you can kind of tell who they are, what they do. Clothing identifies status. You see, in these disciples' effort to usher in the King of kings and the Lord of lords, what did they do? They stripped down their very identity. They stripped down who they were and they laid that for a place to G for Jesus to sit. Are we willing to do that in, that season, in this season? Are we willing to say, Lord, we want to see you ushered into our reality. We want to see you ushered into our lives. We want to see you ushered into our families, our churches, our communities. Are we willing to say, I don't have need of this identity. Lord, it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Am, am I, am I going to allow my identity to become nothing so that way Jesus can become everything in somebody's life? You see, ushering in the Lord requires that we lay down our status, our identity, who we are. As long as we hold on to those things, I, I want you to know that Jesus can't operate in that. He wants to operate through you, but he, he's, not, <laughs> he, he's not willing to, for you to be lost in that. You have to lose yourself. Jesus actually says this. He says, those who seek to, to save their lives will lose it. Those who seek to lose it will be saved. You see, these disciples, they operated in with a purpose, with a focus. They knew that this was an appointed time that Jesus was going to be ushered in. They said, Lord, I want to make you famous in this moment. I mean, think about that. Jesus was a prophet from Nazareth. Nobody knew who he was. There was hundreds, if not thousands of people likely walking into Jerusalem in that season. But the disciples knew something was special. They knew something was fixing to take place. I believe that God is doing something. God is shaking. The world is shaking. Just as on that day, Palm Sunday, it says that the whole multitudes were moved. They were shaken. They were unnerved. They knew something was significant. And yet, they didn't know what it was. They began to ask, who is this? I believe that today... People are asking that question. I was uh, listening to uh, a ministry, and, and in fact, a couple of ministries, and they quoted uh, a prophecy that was given through David Wilkerson in 1986. And, you know, it's really profound, and it just speaks to the prophetic giftings of, of, of Pastor Wilkerson and, and so many. But I think it even speaks more to this day, and I want to read that to you. It says, I see a plague coming on the world. Keep in mind, this was 1986. David Wilkerson, the then pastor of Times Square Church in, in New York City. He says, I see a plague coming on the world and the bars, churches, and government will shut down. The plague will hit New York City and shake it like it has never been shaken. The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles. And repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit. And out of it will come a third great awakening that will sweep America and the world. 
You know, I believe that we are living in that day today. Undoubtedly, there is a plague that is covering the world. Things are shutting down that I never thought I would see shut down. I mean, I, I can understand shutting down some things, but they are shutting it all down. Why? Because this is a great stirring. This is a great moving. This is a great shaking. The question is going to be, how are we going to respond? I don't want to just get enamored with the power of a prophecy. The power comes to see the prophecy fulfilled. I want to see a great awakening in our nation. I want to see a great awakening in the world. You see, will that sweep across America? Will preachers who have no pulpit, this is our pulpit now, the Internet, will they begin to call a church into repentance? Will they begin to call a church into prayer? Will they begin to call a church into the next awakening, this next revival, a great revival of repentance across the land? You see, the, the disciples gave the example, and the multitudes followed. I, I want to kind of clarify that just for a second. It says, so in verse 8, it says, In a very great multitude, let me, let me back up a little bit. Verse 7 it says, They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And then a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out. They begin to cry out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of God. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You see, we see these words, and we know a week later what takes place, that the Savior of the world was crucified for our sins. They didn't know that then. You see, whenever the disciples begin to set the example, the world begins to watch and follow. The disciples, they set their clothes on the donkey and put Jesus on them. And they begin to declare who Jesus was in the streets. And the people, all the multitudes around them, begin to follow the disciples' decisions, or the, the disciples' example. You see, I believe that today when the church begins to respond to the presence of the Lord. You see, that's exactly what this is. The, the Lord is being ushered in to Jerusalem. When the church begins to respond to the presence of God, the world will begin to respond to the presence of God. You see, we look at church and we say, Lord, we've got great worship music, we've got great buildings, we've got great, great preaching and great sound systems and all these things. But when the church says, the Lord is our God and responds to it. When the church begins to accept, begins to set the example in repentance, begins to set the example in, in, in humility, the world will begin to follow just as they, they did on Palm Sunday. You see, when those that call themselves disciples in this day quit trying to find out what's in it for them and lay down their identities their lifestyles, their broken doctrines and ideas, the world is going to begin to take their lead. Man, I am praying today. I am praying today that you, if you can hear my voice, would you would be humbling yourself in prayer. Begin to, begin to be an example to those who are all around you and how to respond when the King of Kings comes home. I believe that when the church begins to become awakened to the presence of God, the world is going to follow and they're going to begin to do the same thing. The world is watching. They are looking for a Savior. They are moved. They are unner unnerved. They are asking today, who is this? Who is this King of Heaven? Verse 9, And when the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! to the Son of God. That very word means this, literally. It means save us. Save us. You see, whenever the multitudes see Jesus, when they see the King of Kings, the prophesied Messiah, coming riding in on a donkey, just as it was prophesied hundreds of years before, they begin to declare and cry out, Save us, Son of David. Save us, Blessed One. Hosanna! On the highest. See, we are in a season today when the world is looking for a Savior. 
And the Savior is in us. You know, just like in that time, the, the people of Israel, they were, they were under similar circumstances and the fact that their, their nation was under rule of the Romans. They were looking for a deliverer. They were looking for someone to lift them up out of the place that they were in. Today, we're in that season. Are we willing to cry out to Jesus Christ? Are we willing to answer that question that we posed earlier in Matthew 21.10? When the city is moved, when the world is unnerved, when the world is waking up to, to, to this reality that they need a God, they need a Savior, is the church going to do its job in ushering in the king? Are we going to usher in the king, Jesus? Are we going to set the example for them? See, I believe that the church, we may be a good job, be doing a good job of ushering in the king, but we're not, are we accomplishing our task of introducing the world to him? You see, in, in this holy week, and I'm hoping to do some, some studies on this over the next few days, but Jesus, when he comes into Jerusalem, the crowds cheer until they start seeing what he does. What does he do? He begins to heal the sick. He begins to uh, uh, overturn the money changers' tables. He begins to, begins to bring deliverance from a spiritual perspective. You see, the church is great at utter, ushering in the presence, but are we doing our job at introducing the world to their Savior, Jesus Christ? To follow him in obedience to follow Him in hope, to follow Him as our comforter. See, in this season, now is not the time for tribal loyalty. You know, in this season, the church needs to be awakened to a new reality that we need one another. The church, I, we need friends. I, I am a, a born-again, baptized in the Holy Ghost, Pentecostal, full gospel, charismatic, charismatic tongue-talking preacher. But I want you to know today we need to grab hands with our Catholic community. We need to grab hands with our non-denominational brothers. We need to grab hands with our, with our Anglican and Presbyterian. We need to grab hands as a church today and lay down all of these things that separate us and hold on to the things that bind us together. And that is Christ and Him crucified, raised again on a third day that we can all have life and have life more abundantly. Now is not the time for the, for, for the church as the early church that said, you know, we have this denomination. There's some that follow Paul. There's some that follow Apollos. Today we have the same thing. We follow one preacher, one pastor. We do one thing this way and another this way. Now is not the time we need to rise together as a church. We need to begin to cry out in this season. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, Lord. Save us, Lord, in this time. Now is the time for us to step out in a way and allow the world to see Jesus for who He is and not for who we are in Him. You know, I've shared my testimony many times, and I am not the same person that I was some 20 years ago. That's a good thing. But you know, it's not, I don't serve Jesus because he made me a better person. I, I serve Jesus because he is my Lord and Savior. And today I'm saying to you that if you have not made Jesus your Lord and you follow him and you're obedient to him, even in the simple things, even if God puts you on donkey duty, even if God puts you on just laying down your identity to give him a place to sit, to just cushion his ride a little bit. Even if it means that you have to lose yourself to begin to declare who Jesus is in this day, then do it. If you haven't made that decision, it's a very simple decision. You can do that right now. But this is what it takes. It takes total surrender, total abandonment of yourself. Jesus didn't come to make you a better you. Actually, Jesus came that the, the old you could pass away and that the new you can come into existence. In fact, in, in the book of John, Jesus says this, that you must be, how, how do you, he was asked the question, how do we in, inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you must be born again. 
Today, I want you to know, I want to ask you this question. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you been born again? Have you repented of your sins? Have you laid down that old life and grabbed up a new life in Jesus Christ? A life of obedience, a life of comfort, a life of hope, a life of salvation. I want to give you an opportunity to do that with me right now. If you're there, if you have someone around you, I just want you to stand with them as we all stand together. And I want to just ask the Holy Spirit to come into your heart right now. Maybe this is is it. Maybe you might say, you know, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of holding back. I want to dive full into who Jesus is. We can pray for that today. Maybe you've been been saying, you know, I, I know who Jesus is. I know that he's the king of kings. But I've been holding back my everything from him. I've been holding back my identity. Jesus asked, I'm not, I'm holding back my willingness to go and do the simple things that he's called me to do. It's very simple. He asks us to pray for one another, love one another, bear one another's burdens. You can do that today. We have to repent of our old selves and ask Jesus to come and fill that with a new us. The Bible says this. It says that we were all sinners. It says that we've all sinned. And we fall short of God's glory. I want you to think about that. You may know some people who who seem to have it all right. But the truth is, is that you can have it all right on the outside, but you're still lost if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because we've all sinned. And we fall short of God's glory. The wages of sin. The wages. So think about wages. What I've earned. If I go to work, I would expect a paycheck. Well, we've worked really hard in our lives to to be sinners. The wages of what we've worked for, the wages of what we've ignored, what we've earned, our paycheck for that is death. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life. You can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. Man, I, I, I love what Paul says in the book of Corinthians. He says this, he says, Oh, death, where is your sting? That even death is not feared. I fear that I fear suffering of other people. I fear the death of other people. But I don't fear my own death. I know that when I die, that I am together with Christ in that moment. It says that the gift of God is eternal life in Him. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ paid the price for each of us. Listen, friends, I'm telling you right now, I am laying out everything that I am to usher Jesus into who you are, into your reality. That Jesus, we don't have to do anything. Jesus died for us. This is all we have to do to be saved is call on that name of Jesus to make him your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins. Say, Lord, I am turning away from that old life. I want to get plugged into who you are. Would you pray this prayer with me today if that's the decision you want to make? Just close your eyes right where you are. Heavenly Father, I pray that you heal me. Lord, that I am a sinner. Lord, that my eternal destination without you is hell. Lord, that I am a child of darkness, Lord, and I don't want to be anymore. Lord, I lay down everything I am. I sacrifice everything that I have. And I accept you into my life. Jesus, I call upon you today to be my Lord and my Savior. I ask you, Lord, to heal me of my hurts. To heal my body and my mind. Lord, to heal my heart. Lord, be my Lord. Be my Savior. Lord, I accept you. I turn from my wicked ways. Lord, I want to turn towards you today. Amen. I believe that if you prayed that prayer, and you prayed that as a prayer from your heart, that you are saved. This is kind of a strange thing for me. Typically, I would have you come forward, and I want to talk to you, but... 
You can send me an email, joe at youngsvillefirst.com. Or you can call the church office and leave a message. I'm going to call you back, 337-857-0018. And just let them know you'd like a phone call from the pastor. But today I'm asking the church, this is for you, church. If you're saved and you've been born again, I'm asking you today, will you usher in the King of Kings this week? Will you usher in the Lord of Lords in a way that you've never done before? Will you lay down your identity? Will you lay down your pain? Will you lay down everything that you are to welcome in the risen Savior, the one who comes in the name of the Lord? Will you cry out to Him, Lord, save us? Lord, save us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, will you lift your hands right where you are? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you have given your son Jesus for us, Lord. I pray that you begin to light a fire within our hearts. Lord, you begin to light a fire within our minds. Lord, you begin to, to allow us to be the bearers of your message, Lord. Lord, that no longer will we hide behind our cloaks and our identities. Lord, we're not going to hide behind our educations. Lord, our, our relationships, but Lord, we are going to expose ourselves fully to you. Lord, that we are going to rise up in this season, Lord, and welcome in a new awakening of your Holy Spirit across the land. Lord, send revival. Lord, send revival. Lord, would you say this, Lord, send me. Send me, Lord. Send me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, everybody said, amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Is God good? He certainly is. He certainly is. God wants to use us in this season to usher in his presence. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to lay down some comforts for His comfort? Are we willing to lay down our identities to create a path for Him? I mean, think about that. Lord, we thank You, Lord. Lord, we just surrender in obedience to You. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you now if you had a, an opportunity to prepare communion elements. And, and if you haven't, that's okay. You can take communion as a family anytime, but... It's just a great opportunity that we have to celebrate communion together. In fact, as we just begin this week, this time, this season of victory, I'm looking forward to Resurrection Sunday. I believe that Jesus is the victorious one. I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, I can hear the shouts of amen and hallelujah from right there in your living rooms today. Thank you, Lord. Well, we're going to partake of communion I want to just ask you today that, that we just recognize that and take this, take this cup, this bread, this wafer. If you have bread, if you have a cracker, a biscuit, whatever you have there in the house. Just take that in your hand as this is a representation of the body of Christ. Paul gives instructions to 1 Corinthians. I believe that there is healing in communion. You see, the, the reason I believe that is because it says in his word, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. It says this, for this reason, many are sick and weak among you, and many sleep, or many have passed away. You see, if, if he can say that we've taken this in an unworthy manner, so we've fallen into sickness and weakness and death, I believe that when we examine ourselves and we partake of this, this representation of the body of Christ, you see, it's an opportunity for us to confess our sins to him. I just want to take a moment right now, right where you are, just take that bread in your hand. Just take a moment just to examine yourself. Lord 
Jesus. Lord, I just ask that you just forgive us, Lord. No one can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Would you take this bread? Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, for your body that was broken on the cross for us. Lord, that you willfully gave yourself. Lord, you willfully gave. It says for the joy, for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. Lord, you endured the cross for our salvation. We thank you for that, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you bring healing in this land. Lord, you bring renewal in our hearts. Lord, you bring a new fervor to our spirits in this season. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake together. Would you take the cup? It can be some grape juice or some pineapple juice, whatever juice that you have. Would you take that as a representation of the blood of Jesus Christ? Paul says in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, I thank you for that blood that truly does wash our sins away. Lord, that we thank you for the blood that washes our sins not just away, but Lord, white as snow. Lord, that, that we usher in, in this season, your presence, Father. Lord, forgive us. Give us hope again. Because we have a new covenant, a covenant established in your blood, an everlasting covenant in your blood. Lord, we just ask for healing in our land, healing in our hearts. Lord, healing in our assemblies. We thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Will you partake with me? Can we sing this song together before we dismiss? Precious is the flow that makes us white as snow. No other mount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord Jesus, I ask that you be with us this week, that you encourage us in this season. Lord, I pray for opportunities to come from you. Lord, opportunities for us to be used just like these disciples were used on Palm Sunday to create a method to, for, to bring you into our communities, to bring you into our homes, to bring you into our lives. So Lord, we thank you for that. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, right there where you are today. Will you just give the Lord a shout of praise? Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen. Thank you for tuning into First Assembly, where we are a place to meet with God. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss a single video. And hey, share this message with a friend who may need some encouragement. Thank you again for watching. God bless.